a native of Violet Hill, Arkansas. Brooks Blevins is the Noel Boyd Professor of Ozark Studies at Missouri State University in Springfield. He has done so much to preserve and collect and further our understanding of the history and culture of the Ozark region. Well, it's always, it's always nice to be back here at Shiloh. I've lost count of how many times I've had the privilege of, of talking here. And it's always nice to have a, a new subject, and in this case, a new person <laughs> to talk about. And uh, it's a real treat to get to talk about someone that, uh, that none of you has any idea of who she is or who she was. After first digging into her diary about two years ago, I certainly couldn't get her out of my mind, or maybe it's been three years ago. It's been, it's been some time ago, uh, but, but uh, quite a, a singular voice. And this really uh, stems from a diary. This, uh, I, I first met Minnie uh, several years after her death through her diaries. And we have a, one of the people who's to thank for the preservation of the diaries is here on the front row, James Johnston, uh, native of Searcy County. And he's the one who actually gets credit for the donation to the University of Arkansas Special Collections for uh, these diaries. And uh, James tells me there were a couple of other guys who were involved in saving these diaries from probably just disappearing to the world and, uh, and, and keeping them for us to look at. And I think I may have been the first person to ever actually look at these once they were accessioned and once they were processed in the, in the U of A Special Collections. They've been down there and they've been available since the late 90s. But it uh, seems like when I requested these uh, a few years ago, uh, the woman who went and got them for me said, we've never had anyone request these. And, and I was happy about that because uh, someone else would have fallen in love with many first if, if I hadn't have met her. But the, uh, this, this is really about uh, Minnie's diaries and getting to know someone through their diaries and uh, even digging a little deeper into psychology and all that kind of stuff because of her diaries. The, uh, unfortunately, uh, the diaries are not complete. I'm guessing just from the almost compulsive manner in which Minnie seemed to keep her diaries, I'm guessing that there were at, at one time a complete set of diaries for who knows how long, maybe going back to her teenage years, but uh, we only have bits and pieces of her diaries that have survived, with the earliest being in 1934 and her last entry being in 1972, just a couple of years before her death. But, and, and there are uh, large gaps in there uh, that I've often wondered just what they contained, what uh, sort of nuggets were in there. But Minnie was a, uh, as I mentioned, she was an, an avid diarist. She, she kept her own personal diary. She kept her son's diary. She would often label it Lawrence's diary. And she would keep a diary of everything that he did during the day. And she would find that out by quizzing him when he got home at night. Uh, Lawrence uh, never married, and he, and he lived with his mother until uh, she went in the nursing home. And even in, in a couple of the diary entries, she mentions sitting at the kitchen table asking Lawrence what he did that day and writing it down. And I can just imagine her prying into his personal life. Uh, and, uh, and he told her uh, there were some things in, in his diary that he had obviously had to have told his mother uh, he did. But uh, I'm not, he may not have told her uh, everything that, that he did. In addition to that, she kept other sorts. She kept a weather diary, and some of those have survived. And these are not just what the high and low and, uh, and what the rainfall was. These are narrative diaries of the weather that sometimes would be a paragraph or more describing changes in the weather during the day. Uh, she was very meticulous about all of this stuff. And there are other sorts of diaries or logs in the collection uh, for instance, uh, in the, and we'll get to this story in a minute, it, during the Depression, uh, when her family was in really dire straits, she kept a log of all the food that people donated to them. And she would keep uh, very meticulous records of all the money that they spent. 
and I never found any records of mo the money they made, and I don't know that they made any, but uh, they had to have made something. But they very, they very much lived a hand-to-mouth existence in Searcy County for, for many, many years, and, uh, and we are lucky to have some record of that. One of the things that most intrigued me about these diaries is the style in which they were written, and I've been doing research in archives for the better part of a quarter century now, and this is the most singular set of diaries I've ever come across. Not in their, I guess you could say, the, the, the conventional import of their content. It's not that she's talking about visiting heads of state and what and eating breakfast with the president and stuff like that there's never a mention of anyone that she comes into contact with in any of those diaries that you would recognize these are all just local people who lived around her there in Searcy County the only time she ever mentions anyone famous is when she talks about hearing a Billy Graham radio sermon or something like that or listening to Winston Churchill on, on the radio uh, that was her conduit to the wider world uh, when it worked, and Lawrence didn't always keep the radio uh, up and up and working. But there's nothing uh, of great importance in the content of any of those diaries or any of her letters that have survived. It's that voice. Uh, she writes in a third-person voice, which is very unusual for a diarist to do, to write in the third person. And we will uh, hear her voice in the third person later on. She seems only to have started doing that uh, after World War, or around the time of World War II. The diaries that we have from the 1930s are, are much shorter. They're more like what you find in most diaries that survive. They're just two or three sentences of what I did today and you know, what sort of problems are going on and, and that sort of stuff. But around the time of World War II and then for the rest of her diaries afterward, she writes these long, long passages of narration in third person, which is uh, very, very uh, odd and, and interesting, both. And one of the things, and, and this is the, the case with many diaries that you come across, nothing was too mundane to be recorded. Just to give you a, a sample, this is from Friday, May the 1st, 1959. And this is really reflective of what most of Minnie's diary entries are like. I've picked out some of the more interesting ones that Susan and I will read little passages from today. But this is kind of, gives you a sense of her diaries and the sort of mundane features of her diaries and the compulsive, ongoing nature of her diaries. Uh, she always notes the date, Friday, May 1st, 1959. She talks about making Lawrence's dinner and supper for tomorrow as he might want them. If not, nothing lost. Many lay down. Here she is in third person uh, referring to herself. Many lay down several times in the morning and a while afternoon and slept maybe 45 minutes. She tried to get to write up on this diary before night, but didn't succeed. She was behind on this, her diary, including Friday, April 17th, up to and including today, May 1st but started writing up on it about 7 p.m. and wrote until 11 p.m., taking time out to eat her supper. She only got the weather record for today and started Lawrence's diary for today and then wrote Friday, April 17th, and Saturday, April 18th of this diary and was so sleepy she quit and went to bed at about 11.30 p.m. She did not get up when Lawrence came home, had mostly overcome the breaking the chain, so did not have so much trouble, she's talking about something that happened to him, so did not have so much trouble with it today, but didn't keep record of how many ricks he got sawed today. He was working at a saw mill. And, that, and this goes on for four pages. <laughs> I read almost a quarter of her diary entry for that day, and most of them are like that. Most of them you just kind of pull your hair out and think, well, you know, who's... Who's going to read this and, and find anything interesting? But if you keep reading, you come across these little gems of, of things that she, she has to say, and that's what we'll concentrate on today. But that is the truth. If, if any of you have ever uh, done research and, and looked at old diaries from the 19th century or the, or the 18th century, most of them are like that. 
most of them offer us very little of importance. And, and it's just one dry day after another. Uh, and only if you're related to them somehow would they, would they be interesting. But Minnie's style certainly uh, sometimes breaks out into interesting little nuggets. But first of all, who was uh, Minnie Atterbury? And that's uh, what she was known uh, as most of her life, Minnie Atterbury. She was born in southern Illinois in 1888. Uh, she grew up on uh, her parents' farm. And uh, from what the descendants tell me, and I, and I was able to track down a great-grandson and a great-granddaughter, and they had much information about her because as far as they were concerned, she was their grandmother and we'll explain why that uh, is the case later. Uh, but according to them, she uh, was a school teacher. Uh, she was obviously very intelligent. She was uh, very well read. She was very literate. It's one of, the, one of the best written diaries that I've come across in the Ozarks. Uh, there are very few grammatical mistakes, very few misspelled words. Uh, she writes like a, a former school teacher would. But she apparently uh, taught school briefly, and then her teaching career, as uh, was the custom back in those days, would have been ended when she married John Gardner in 1909. And I don't know much about John Gardner, and he's not really central to this story. Uh, he's long gone by the time the diaries come around. But she and John Gardner had two children, Lawrence, who I've already referred to, to Lawrence, who was born in 1910, and Della, uh, her daughter, who was born in, in 1912. Uh, she was a tall, a tall woman. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how tall she was. I, the uh, the great grandchildren seem to think she was probably around 5'10", so she would have been a massively tall woman for for those days. And she was a big, kind of raw boned uh, woman as well. And, and uh, one of our readings, she even references her weight, uh, her weight issues. And uh, we'll get to find out how much Minnie weighed. She and John Gardner divorced in, in 1916. And two years later, she remarried, uh, this time to a, a man who was quite a bit younger than her by the name of Sylvester Atterbury. And Sylvester and Minnie had uh, one child, a son named Robert. Uh, who was born in Illinois in, in 1922. And we're going to get to hear Minnie's description of, uh, this is our first, uh, one of the, the good diary entries. Am I reading this or are you reading this? I'm reading this. Okay, good. I was, I was very tempted to have uh, women read all of these parts, and I thought, what am I doing here if I just come up here and give you papers to, to read? <laughs> but uh, uh, Susan's going to read... Uh, a segment from a diary entry, I think in 50, 1957, mm -hmm. is that right? From a 1957 diary entry uh, by Minnie Atterbury. July 4th, 1957. This is Minnie's son, Robert Atterbury's birthday. He was born July 4th, 1922, which is 35 years ago. If he were alive, he would be celebrating his 35th birthday anniversary today. At his birth, Minnie hemorrhaged until she was drained of nearly all her blood and blacked out for a while. The doctor attending her did what he could to save her and then left, instructing those caring for her to not let her go to sleep. Minnie's sister, Levina, who was with her later, told her she was blacked out for probably 30 minutes. Evidently, sister had sat during those 30 minutes watching her and calling out her name. As Minnie began to come out of that blackout, she thought, where am I? Who am I? And then she was conscious of who she was and that she had given birth to her son and opened her eyes so that sister knew she was conscious again. So Levina asked her if she thought it would be all right for Della, Minnie's 10-year-old daughter, to sit there and keep her awake. Minnie told her it would and that she would fight the sleep herself as she knew what was at stake having gone through this experience when Della was born. So Della sat there and called her name every time she even started to close her eyes. It seemed like she sat there one hour at least or even more keeping Minnie awake. It was an experience Minnie never wanted to go through with again and did not ever. Every 4th of July, in memory, Minnie relives that day again. So some, uh, Minnie was not, I should mention, Minnie was not much of a soul searcher. That's about as close as she ever gets to really 
being introspective, the vast, vast majority of her diary entries are more like the one that I read a little portion from. They're very matter-of-fact, very kind of surfacey uh, stuff. And, uh, and, and so this one was special in that it gave us a kind of a glimpse into, into Minnie's past and into, into Minnie's thoughts, uh, her, her feelings. And so that was, that was neat. I think Minnie probably suffered from eclampsia or some uh, similar malady. Uh, it appears that fr from the records that we have, it appears that she almost bled out on all three of her births. It, she only mentions in there that she suffered the same thing with Della. She suffered the same thing with Lawrence as well. We know that from a, a letter uh, that survived that her mother wrote shortly after Lawrence's birth to other family members saying that Minnie almost died in, in this birth. So, so certainly she suffered mightily to bring three kids in, into the world, and unfortunately she would outlive two of them. Uh, Minnie and Sylvester divorced then not long after Robert's birth. Now they're still in Illinois at this time. They're actually living in northern Illinois at this time, Sylvester was some sort of laborer. I don't know exactly what he did, but they weren't very well off. And that's when she ends up coming to Arkansas. Her story uh, intersects with uh, perhaps Searcy County's most colorful 20th century story, and that's the story of the incoming kingdom unit. Some of you may be familiar with this a millennialist preacher by the name of John Battenfield in southern Illinois in the World War I era had decided that he had cracked the code in the books of Daniel and Revelation and wherever else uh, the, uh, the codes are in the Bible, and he had figured out when the end times were going to occur and what was going to happen. In Battenfield's world, uh, the end times would be a massive worldwide war between Catholics and Protestants. What the other tens of millions of people who were neither Catholic or Protestant would do in the process, he didn't really explain, but in his world, everyone was either Protestant or Catholic. And uh, in order to sort of ready for this and protect themselves from this, Battenfield's idea was to found the sort of mountain retreats. And uh, one of the three that he founded was in Searcy County. It wasn't an isolated retreat in, in, in one sense in that he basically just found a place that was right on the railroad. This was back in the days of the Missouri-North Arkansas Railroad, and they settled in the little community of Gilbert and bought land in Gilbert. Some of you have been to Gilbert or you know where it is just off of 65. It's more remote today than it was in World War I when the railroad was running through there and it was right on the, the main line. Anyway, uh, Minnie's brother was also a Disciples of Christ minister and had somehow gotten involved with Battenfield and had come south to Arkansas to be part of Battenfield's uh, community in Searcy County. And that's uh, what brought Minnie down here. I'm, I'm, and Minnie may also, uh, one, of the, one of the interesting things, her diaries never reveal her religious beliefs. Again, she wasn't that introspective. Uh, she mentions listening to various radio preachers over the years, but she never once talks about a sermon topic or talks about her own religious beliefs. It's just very matter of fact. Uh, Reverend Hitchcock, I heard him at 6.30 on Sunday morning, that kind of stuff. It's uh, just very matter of fact stuff. But we do know that Minnie was a subscriber to the Kingdom Harbinger, which was Battenfield's newspaper uh, in which he espoused his end of times beliefs. And it's uh, largely due to many subscribing to this newspaper that we have a lot of the copies that we have today at the University of Arkansas. Many of her newspapers survived. Anything that she ever had survived because many was a hoarder. <laughs> she, she was a hoarder. She didn't have much, but what she had stayed on that place. Until, until it burnt or somebody threw it away or somebody sold it. And, uh, and so we're, we're lucky to have some of those uh, issues of that newspaper as well. But again, we don't really know where many stood. There's one, there was one brief reference during World War II that she made, I think in a letter, in which she sounded to be somewhat uh, not a big fan of Battenfield. But nobody would have been by then because his thing had already failed and, and uh, he had already left in the dark of night and, and uh, didn't come back. 
but we, in the end, we just don't know. But at some point in around 1923, 1924, Minnie and her three children came south without uh, Sylvester. They either lived with or lived in the vicinity of her brother Francis on Star Mountain, uh, which is not in the Gilbert area. Star Mountain is actually down southwest of Marshall a pretty good ways. And what they were doing on Star Mountain, I don't really know, but that's, that's where they uh, were for a few years. And uh, the, the descendants believe that she taught school briefly upon her arrival in Arkansas. Uh, in 1929, Minnie and uh, Lawrence bought a 40-acre farm near the little railroad stop of Zach. It wasn't a, a great river bottom or creek bottom farm. $75 wasn't going to get you much, even in 1929. And they pretty much got what they paid for, which was a rocky, rugged hillside uh, that was almost impossible to survive on. So wonder that they did survive for as for as many years as they did living on that on that hillside. And I have been to their old farm. It's uh, it's nothing to look at today, and I'm I'm sure it wasn't in in 1929. It is just. Uh, uh, the old house is still there, and it's just perched on the side of a hill. It looks like it could fall off and roll down at, at any point. Uh, but it was not a great place to, to farm. Uh, her daughter, Della, uh, died in 1932, leaving uh, two small children. Della married at 15, and before she was 20, she had had two children. And at her death, the children lived with their father for a number of years and then eventually moved in with Minnie and Lawrence. And they, they, raised, they primarily raised those kids. And, uh, and it's Christie's children that I contacted, the great-grandkids. And since they never knew their grandmother, Della, uh, Minnie was always grandma to them uh, when they came up from Texas and, and visited. And they had many, many good memories of her and, and Lawrence. But they did live in... Uh, oftentimes in abject poverty, and we get little glimpses of that from, from her diary. And I'm going to read you her description of her fight with pellagra, the uh, niacin deficiency disease that affected lots of people in the rural south in the early 20th century, uh, lots of poor people who had uh, corn-heavy diets, and, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people succumbed to this, and, and we'll listen to her description of this. And this actually comes from a letter that she wrote. This is uh, the one instance that I have that's not a diary entry, but it's, a, it's a, one of the few surviving letters that we have. She writes, and she's writing in, uh, in 1941 or 42, I don't remember exactly which year, but she writes, uh, last year I got down in bed and in such a shape that I knew myself I was going to die, and soon if something were not done to help me. When my food supply would run out, it would seem that every beat of my heart would be the last. And then when I would eat a meal and get a new food supply, then my heart would beat so fast and hard that it felt like it would jump right through my chest. On the afternoon of the 10th of March, I went to bed. Lawrence was gone from home working for a man to get some money to get things we needed, such as food. The little grandchildren were here. I had them to do up the evening work and start supper. I told them that I might die. I told them not to be afraid, and, and from what the great-grandkids say, that's, that was Minnie. She was very direct and would have told her small grandchildren, I may not make it. I told them not to be afraid. I told them what to do till Lawrence came if I did die. I was in such a condition that I didn't know whether I would live a minute or an hour longer or even if I would live through the night. I knew Dr. Bing could cure me. And next day, Lawrence went to Marshall to get Dr. Bing to come out to see me. The sun was going down while he stood by my bed and examined me, and we lit the lamp before he left. They didn't have electricity. That was the only trip he made out to see me. Dr. Bing gave me some medicine that in about an hour after I took it would tingle with life clear out to the very tip ends of my fingers and toes. You know, I wish I could feel like I did then. That's what you would call robust health just brimful and running over with life and well-being. One would feel like moving the world. That medicine would last 12 hours. He gave that the first few days and then put me on that Fleischmann's yeast and a red-coated tablet. And yeast was generally the thing that, that doctors prescribed for that. Probably what the doctor had given, 
given her was uh, nicotinamide uh, and maybe some sort of some sort of stimulant to sort of uh, get her going there. But uh, again, it's one of those uh, many stories that, that we get. And it was one that a lot of poor people would have dealt with in those days. And that's, again, that's another interesting thing about this diary is to have a look into the world of the poor that you usually don't get in diaries. Most, most diarists are middle class or upper class people. They're people who've been educated and have the time and the wherewithal to, to keep diaries. Uh, and many certainly didn't fit that characteristic. She represented a, a segment of society that we usually don't hear from uh, after they have passed away. We usually have to rely on statistics uh, to figure out what's going on in that kind of lower level of society. Not everything is, uh, we, we started with some tragedy here in, in Minnie's life, but certainly not everything was tragic. And if you keep reading through the diaries, you're sort of uplifted once you get to the 1950s because Minnie almost becomes a new woman in the 50s. And most of that is because in 1954, Minnie and Lawrence got electricity. And it's amazing what electricity did for, especially for women who were basically housewives, uh, women who were at home all day, like many, uh, to have electricity and uh, all of a sudden have access to some of those electric appliances that she had, did a lot of things to, to change her life. And, and we, we get little glimpses of that in her diaries. Unfortunately, the diaries for that era are very incomplete, and there are months and months and months and even years missing from those, and I wish they were, they were still here. But what we do have uh, gives us a real good look into, into her life. This is uh, from May 16th, 1954. This is just very shortly after they've got electricity at their place. She writes, uh, again, in the third person, then she fixed to bake the wacky cake. And I don't know what a wacky cake is, but somebody can probably tell me what a, a wacky cake is. Uh, she fixed to bake the wacky cake she has been planning to make for the last several days. She was going to use the new electric oven for the first time without anyone to help her and be entirely responsible. She was rather nervous about it as she had not ever used an electric oven before and realized her responsibility in using it. I mean, who, who wrote diary entries like this. She got the dough and everything ready, then preheated the oven according to instructions Mrs. Daniel gave. That, that was uh, the woman at the store where she bought at E. Daniel, uh, where she bought the, the oven, and which the instruction book with the range gives. Then she baked the cake and made the icing and had very satisfactory results. She will not feel so nervous from now on when using the oven. And that's her entry. And one of the interesting things, I, when I first found Minnie, a few days later, I, I went to Marshall, and, and I went to Daniel's hardware store. And uh, is it, what, George? Uh, George is the son of, uh, of Mrs. Daniel in, in the story, and he still runs the hardware store. And, uh, and he's, he's a, I'm not sure how old he is, but he was, even before I mentioned this story, we were sitting there, and he said, uh, we were talking about Minnie, and he remembered Minnie well, and he said, he said, you know, I remember taking an electric oven out to their, uh, delivering it out to their farm. And he said, we almost couldn't get it to the house because of all the junk we had to go through in the yard. And that's something we'll get to a little bit later. Uh, Lawrence was also a hoarder, only his hoarding involved farm implements and uh, big stuff, iron and steel uh, contraptions, and, and the, their farm basically became a junkyard and, and was by 1954 because Mr. Daniel uh, was a teenager at the time, and he said we just had to kind of weave in and out of the, of the junk to get, uh, and he said uh, what he remembered about Minnie, everybody you talked to who remembered Minnie said she was whip smart and she was kind of intimidating to be, because she was, a, she was a big woman and she was smart, and he said, uh, he said she was probably the only customer we had who read the instruction book from front to back <laughs> and basically had it memorized. He said, uh, and I'm not sure, I've, I've heard this from other people as well, how much of this is just sort of fun anecdote, but he said uh, in those days when we first started selling these, these electric ovens, we had to bring some of them back because people started fires in them. You know, they'd, they'd load wood in there and, 
And uh, now I'm not sure how often that happened. It probably, I'm sure it happened at least once. But anything that, that's told sitting around a stove at a hardware store, you know, I don't know how that's going to stand up in, in scholarly <laughs> history. But, but many was one of the ones who, who stood out as really kind of grasping what, what this was about. And as you can tell from the diary entry, how serious she was about this. And, uh, and here's our next one from Susan. Many and the telemarketer. This is also from May 1954. A Mrs. Mack from Little Rock, Arkansas called. She was selling Armstrong plastic rugs, size 12 by 18 feet. At first, she asked $15 for one rug and get the second one free. Seeing that many had three rooms, she then offered three rugs for $20, and many still refusing to buy, she, Mrs. Mack, offered the three rugs for $18 and again offered two for $12. Many did not buy any rugs for two very main reasons. She had no money at hand to buy anything with, much less with these rugs. Second, Lawrence was not present to sanction the deal and she would not buy without his consent. So many of the, yeah, the, the hard sell rug telemarketer, it's interesting, too, because uh, Minnie and Lawrence had a complicated relationship. Uh, in, in many ways, uh, he was not her equal. And, uh, and it is interesting that she still sort of insisted on staying within her sphere, you might say, her kind of womanly sphere, even though she was better educated and, and smarter and dealt with people better. Well, I don't, I don't know that she dealt with people better, but she was uh, superior to Lawrence in many ways. But maintained you know his position as head of the household throughout their lives after he had grown and this is a this is one of my favorite ones and this is a it's sort of many wakes up in a new world uh, kind of kind of thing uh, when many goes to town and of course we're talking about Marshall uh, as the the town that she she goes to and let me just read uh, read a little bit of this May 21st 1954 they led her out, and he, she's talking about Lawrence and his friend that she rode to, to Marshall with. They led her out in front of Lay's store. She went into the store and noticed on their clock that it was only 7.40 a.m. She was a stickler for time. You see, all through her diaries, there's just exact times. She stood around in the store, bought groceries, and then noticed it was 9 a.m. So she stood around a lot. She came back to Eoff's store and stopped to look at their electric stoves, refrigerators, and irons, then stopped at the post office and got the mail, which had not been got for about 12 days. There was a stack of it. She went back to Lay's store and found a seat and sat down to look over the mail. There was three letters to Lawrence and the pet milk recipe booklet and the Laredo ballpoint pen from Folger's Coffee, which she had sent for. On her way back to Lay's store, she stopped at Jack Treese's store, intending to have them show her an electric Maytag washer if they had one. When she went into the store, no one came to wait on her. She noticed the television set they had going and sat down to look and listen. The 11.30 program was just beginning. It was an economist giving recipes. A home economist. It was very interesting to her, as she's always collecting recipes. The next program, at home with Julie, 11.45 to 12, was an interesting program. Julie had a special guest as she does each weekday. I'm not sure how she knew that. I guess they said it. This guest was an artist and had several pictures to show. The next program, 12 to 12.30, Little Rock Today, gave the news and the weather and showed a 1902 model car as a special entertainment along with the giving of news and weather. It was now 12.30 and she had sat there a whole hour. She had to tear herself away. She could have sat there all afternoon, but she knew she'd better come on home. She wanted to look at Mays, at Mays's electric irons, so went over to their store and looked at them, then stopped in at Daniel's store to look at his irons and to have a word with him about the electric range and refrigerator. She went back to Lay's store. They were about ready to bring her home, but she had time to eat her lunch she had taken along, and then she went to Russell's to weigh herself. She weighed 202 pounds. Seems she's going to have to eat smaller helpings of the food she eats so that she can lose some weight. She should only weigh 165 to 170 pounds. 
That means that she should lose about 35 pounds. <laughs> That's the many that I fell in love with, and, and, I, and I so regretted that only one month from 1954 survived in her, in her diaries, because who knows what else kinds of adventures she had. I mean, you could almost write a sitcom around <laughs> many in 1954, you know. Many becomes Lucille Ball and and, and and the rural Ozarks. I mean, it, it just it's uh, in in many ways it's it sort of smashes a lot of these stereotypes we have about uh, these old farm women and stuff. And and she she seemed so willing to embrace all this new technology that was that was coming along, even though they just ultimately they didn't have the money to to get all that stuff. They apparently did have a television. But I don't think it ever worked. There was no reception there. Now, one of the things that struck me as I, as I went through this diary, and I read the entire diary, and, and I think I was almost, I almost understood many by the time this was over, which was scary to me, uh, because many, one of the things I noticed, especially as I got into the 50s and 60s, is many had some psychological issues. There were some things going on there there's, there, there are reasons why her diaries uh, were so singular and so unlike anything that I had, had come across before. And I started wondering, you know, what would explain some of the eccentricities that come out very forcefully in these diaries. So I decided to put Minnie on the couch. <laughs> and, I, and, and this was a couple, almost two years ago. And so I contacted the head of the psychology department at Missouri State. And I said, uh, I, said I need to to talk with one of your clinical psychologists, and I kind of gave him a short synopsis of what, what I was wanting to do. I was wanting to uh, psychologically evaluate someone who had been dead for 40 years, uh, which I don't think they get a lot of requests for <laughs> in, in, in psychology departments. And he said, he sent me a list, and he said, he was real nice about it. I was, I was afraid, you know, he was just going to tell me to buzz off. But, but he sent me a list of three of their professors. He said, he said any one of these will be great for that. And and so I looked at their little profiles on the, on the uh, website, and I noticed one of them was a graduate of the University of Arkansas. And so I thought, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll visit her. And, and so I went, her name is Brooke Wisenhunt, and, and I went over in January of a couple years ago, and I, and I met with Brooke, and, and, and before we got started, uh, I, I said, uh, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with this area, but uh, this is, this is in, uh, down south of Harrison in, in Searcy County. And she said, well, well, my maiden name is Leslie. And, and, uh, and Leslie's named after my ancestor. And uh, so I thought, well, this is divine guidance or something here. You're, you're the person to, to, uh, to do this. And so, so Brooke and I sat there for a long time, and I, and I, had, and I didn't ask her to read the diary, but, but I kind of described it to her. And we, we talked about it for a long time, and we decided, or she mostly decided, because I don't uh, know all this stuff, that what made many, many was that she seemed to be a classic case of someone who had obsessive-compulsive personality disorder. Now, most of you are familiar with uh, obsessive-compulsive disorder, you know, the hand-washing and the people who go back and make sure their, their front door is locked a million times, and... and, uh, and a lot of us have little bits of that, you know, I think. But, uh, but obsessive compulsive person personality disorder is, is something different. And I just want uh, just to uh, tell you a little bit because I would stumble all over if I didn't read this. Uh, but uh, modern psychiatry defines OCPD as a pervasive pattern of preoccupation with orderliness, perfectionism, and mental and interpersonal control at the expense of flexibility, openness, and efficiency. Uh, and, and many certainly exhibited an abnormal preoccupation with details, rules, lists, order, organization, or schedules, and an and, and intense perfectionism that often prevented her from completing ordinary daily tasks. And she also reflected an inflexibility about matters of morality, ethics, or values, and an inability to discard worn out or worthless objects. And the, the best story, this is, this is the best, uh, I think, quick description of a hoarder I've ever heard. And James Johnston told me this one. He, he, he visited her house uh, long after she was passed away. But Lawrence really hadn't, he was a hoarder too, so he didn't throw anything away from when she was there. 
And James came across a cigar box, and inside the cigar box was a, a whole bunch of uh, string. And many had labeled the box, string too short to use. <laughs> I mean, that, you could only be a hoarder if, if, you, if you recognize you're keeping things that are unusable, and you label them as unusable. But here they are. But her string, too short to use. And, 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 uh, and, and Brooke uh, decided uh, that, you know, many sounded like a, a classic example of this. Uh, someone who, who had trouble maintaining relationships with others because she uh, did tend to be a perfectionist and expected people uh, to be perfect uh, all the time. And she probably had a, a little touch of, of OCD as well, though her uh, descendants don't remember any of the kind of telltale signs of that. Uh, Brooke felt that her intensive diary keeping may actually have been a compulsion. Uh, and and the, the long, sort of tedious way that she kept that diary, she probably just kind of felt like she had to. And uh, just a couple more things. I know we're, we're running uh, late on time, and I'll, I'll let uh, Susan read number eight. You're reading number eight, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll skip one of these, and then we'll kind of wrap it up. They had just said, we'll try to sleep some more until the alarm rings. Then heard a car coming, and Minnie said, now who can that be this early? About then, the horn began to blow, and Lawrence said, well, that's Leroy. Minnie said, surely not. Lawrence said, listen at the horn blow. No one does that but Leroy. By that time, the car stopped. Lawrence was getting out of bed to go to see who it was and what was wanted. When he got to the door, he saw that it was Leroy. Minnie said, is it Leroy? <laughs> Lawrence said, yes. She said, sure enough. Lawrence said, yes, it is Leroy. In the afternoon, Lawrence remarked, we were so sure we weren't going to let anyone or anything hinder us today. Almost looked like God planned it different for us. As you can imagine, a, a, a grown son and... Uh, and his mother living together for as many years as they did in, in tight quarters led to some spats. Uh, and, and she often recorded these in, in her diary. And, and this is one. Uh, and, and generally, they seem funny to us today. I'm sure they were very serious to her. But I'll just read one of these. And I, I didn't note the date on this. But uh, she writes, uh, They ate, and Lawrence went right to bed at 8.30 p.m. A lot of times if she noted he went to bed early, she was probably mad at him. He, being sort of a typical man, he was out working all day and thought, well, I'll come home and eat and go to bed. And Minnie's been working all day at home, and then she's up washing dishes and stuff after he goes to bed. But uh, she says, Minnie washed up what dishes were dirty, mixed powdered milk, and got everything done and turned the light on in the bedroom to fix her bed. The light waked Lawrence, whereupon he started a big howl about her waking him and stomping around and making noise so he can't sleep. Short, he just wanted to show how stinking he can be. <laughs> About 12.30, she waked up coughing and coughed until she coughed some phlegm up. She got up to spit and went to the kitchen to get some salt to eat to stop the cough, used the night bucket, we needed to know that. <laughs> and at this time, Lawrence got up and went out on the porch and bawled out, why don't you do something to stop that cough? Many answered that that was what she was trying to do. She took a dose of Waits Green Mountain Cough Syrup and went back to bed. Then Lawrence began a tirade about what he was going to do and blah, 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 like he does to be hateful to her. Even the blah, blah, blah is in there. Uh, it's, it's in the diary. Uh, there, and there are lots of, uh, lots of these things, and I, I'm not going to read the, uh, the one about Lawrence's troublesome friends in case any of you are descended from his... <laughs> Uh, what I will say is that, that one, one uh, characteristic of a person with OCPD is that they, they almost never approve of their uh, children's or acquaintances' friends, or, and, they, and they, they, um, they rarely have close friend, friendships themselves that last for very long because they're, they're such perfectionists that they, they tend to drive people away. And in all the years of her diaries, she never said one positive thing about any of Lawrence's friends. And it was clear that uh, she, was, she was quite meddlesome and did her best to sort of isolate Lawrence from, 
his friends because she didn't approve of, of any of them. And so, you know, you get all kinds of, of stuff in, in these diaries, and, and, uh, and not all of it is good. But Lawrence remained a, a very kind of good-hearted, uh, light-hearted uh, fella throughout his life. And if you talk to people in Marshall today, the ones who remember him told me that he was shell-shocked. But I don't think his eccentricities had anything to do with being shell-shocked. Uh, his World War II record indicates he never left the United States. Uh, I think it's either nature or nurture, either one. <laughs> either one, he was going to come out of there with a bundle of psychological issues. And, uh, and apparently he was uh, exhibited a lot of the same sorts of characteristics that his mother did and Lawrence in late, very late in uh, Minnie's life even started to keep these extremely tiny, detailed diaries himself. And you can, you can tell the ones that are his in the, in the U of A special collections, uh, how they differ from hers. Uh, Lawrence uh, never married, as I said earlier, and he had to put Minnie in a nursing home. I imagine that it probably shortened Minnie's life when, when, uh, when that happened. Uh, but that was, that's the end of uh, the singular voice that was Minnie Atterbury.